what I wanted to do, some of you are aware that um, we lost a longtime member and good friend of the London RASC, Tom Glinos, just recently and very relatively suddenly. And I thought it would be appropriate to um, talk about his life as it relates to the London RASC. And, and so that's what I want to do today. And I just start off with a few pictures. I mean, the London RAC is interesting because because we're in London and because Western Western is there. I mean, a lot of the people who go to Western who are interested in astronomy end up in the London RAC. And there's a whole generation of baby boomers. Uh, and that's what happened to them in the in the 1970s. I think Peter went to Western, I think it was with Mike Flagel in 1973. And then I went to Western in 1980, and there was just a whole group of people in that range, and we all became London Center members, and we all did a lot of things together, and we're still trying to do a lot of things together. And I'm, so I'll just show a few slides. This is Tom on the left at the 1979 General Assembly Planning Committee meeting up at Western. Um, London Center has hosted the General Assembly about three times, and, and so this was a, a very young group of people. Uh, who put together an entire RASC GA. And there's the official photograph of the London GA up at Western. And if I zoom in here, I believe, Peter, this is Tom right here. And I've drawn a little arrow there because my arrow goes over to this guy here, Mark Sinkins. And this is the first of a few Tom stories that I remember. Back in the, the late 70s, Tom and I were pulling into Mark Sinkins' driveway in a GM Forenza, a really old one. And the steering failed just as we completed the turn into the driveway. And so you look at sort of luck and circumstance. And, you know, I think back on that. And, you know, had the steering failed on the 401, neither Tom nor I might have been members of the London Center for very long. But we were lucky that it failed where it did. Um, this was a London RAC trip. I don't even know to where. And I think this picture was taken in Chatham or Sarnia or someplace. And uh, that's Tom right there in the middle, Mike Flagel. It looks like Gene Jedeke, and that's Leslin Flagel there. But why we stopped, I mean, look at the name of this place. How could amateur astronomers not stop at the clock drive in? This is a great early London RAC trip. And most of the main uh, protagonists in the Lennon RASC are actually featured in here. A um, couple of people of note, Steve Sharp, who passed away last December. And uh, here's Tom Glinos, front and center. And there's a great story that goes along with this trip, which was to this big green thing in the back, which is, I think, the Abrams Planetarium. And Peter's going to enlighten us on this picture right now. Okay, put me on the spot, Dale. Thank you. Yeah, so what happened was... Uh, we had a large enough group that wouldn't fit in any one person's car. So we rented a van. And I, if I remember correctly, this was even before the present day restrictions on how big of a van you could drive with a regular driver's license. So even though we had a dozen or however many folks were in that previous photo, we were able to uh, rent a van and we rented the van, everything went well. We got there, we had a wonderful time. And when we came back out to make our departure, we found that uh, whoever it was that had charge of the keys had lost them somewhere. And we spent an hour looking around in the grass and went back into the planetarium to ask about uh, under the seats and so on and so forth. But there, there was no luck. We were, were not going to find the keys to that van. And Tom caught, said that, that it was no problem. I don't remember how we even got into the van if the darn thing was, maybe it was a separate uh, key for the ignition and separate key for the doors. But once we got into the van, Tom had the full confidence that he'd be able to get us on the road again. And here he is taking the uh, taking this iconic step of hot wiring the rented van so that we could all get back home. And of course, it helped us immeasurably that day because I'm not sure what else we could have done if we didn't have, have, have a key to that darn thing. But uh, what's great about the story is it really does illustrate Tom's nature as a tinkerer, a problem solver, and indomitable when it came to, you know, trying something. If there was a problem that needed to be solved and somebody, Tom thought he had a way of fixing it, then he was fearless at attacking the problem. And it all did work out. We, we drove the van back and when we dropped it off at the rental agency, they tried to charge us 
for cutting a new key, but we told them that it was their fault that they didn't have a second key in their office and we wouldn't pay the, uh, the, the key cutting fee. And of course, we didn't tell them anything about how Tom had hotwired it. We told them we'd lost the key just after we arrived back in London. And of course, they had no choice but to, but to believe us on that. So it all worked out in the end and made for this great story. Thanks, Peter. I'll just go back one slide because I did want to point out this guy here in the middle is not from London. This is Jack Brisbane of the Lowbrow Astronomers uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, a longtime member of the London RSC who lives in the United States. And you'll see a few pictures of him as I go through this today. But uh, here's a here's another picture from about 1981. And I'm I've got Peter Jedicke here, and I recognize Charlie Fassel, and here's Tom Glinos on the left, and they went down to the Cape, Peter, to see what launch. Well, Dale, the plan was to see the first launch of the space shuttle in uh, April of 1981. And uh, we got there. If I remember correctly, the schedule for was for it to launch on April 10th. They scrubbed it early in the morning. And from the news reports we were getting during the day, uh, it looked like they had no clue how they were going to solve this scrub. So the, the four of us from Canada, the fellow in the middle between Charlie Fassel and myself is Brian Whitaker. Uh, who was a member of Victoria Center, and he was a teenager, and his parents had given him special permission to fly to Toronto to join us in our flight down there. But we decided that there was probably very little chance that they would get the space shuttle fixed within a day or two or three or even four or five. So we gave up and we flew back to Ontario. And of course, by the time I got back to London, there was already in the news saying that, oh yeah, they fixed the problem. They were going to launch the very next morning. So they did launch on April the 12th. Um, so anyway, Tom, Tom was really, you know, he was great fun to have on that trip. And between Charlie and, and uh, Brian and I, we had a lot of fun. I can't remember who else was on the trip with us. The other fellow that there that's in that photo was not from London, but he was someone we met down there. And this slide was taken on that trip? No, this, this was a different trip to what was then called the uh, Jackson Space Center. And then later it was known as the Michigan Space Center near in the city of Jackson, Michigan. And basically it was a small museum that was collecting up space artifacts and putting them on display. And so we arrived there, toured the museum and you know, it didn't take us all that much time. We still had time left in the day. We, I'm pretty sure we had a rented van again that day. And we were, the rented van was in the parking lot and they had these exhibits outside. So uh, we kind of stood around and looked at the exhibits and talked about them and so on. And one of the exhibits was an F1 rocket engine, which of course is the engine five of which made up the cluster at the bottom of the Saturn V rocket, which you see over my shoulder here. And uh, there it was sitting there on this concrete pad on display. And if I remember the story correctly, that was an actual authentic F1 engine, not a reproduction or anything like that. And um, Tom was fascinated to study how all the piping and motors and pumps were all arranged up there. And he, like I said before, he was pretty fearless. The fact that the thing was displayed with the bell nozzle on the concrete uh, and all the interesting hardware up on top, that didn't stop Tom. He literally climbed up those ribs and got up there into the guts of the plumbing. And he was poking around in there and looking for something. And of course, the joke we made was that if anybody could get it running, it would be Tom. And that reminds me of another Tom story, which is uh, an executive meeting in Chatham where a bunch of you went down on the train, but the train broke down. Yeah, and you're throwing that back to me, aren't you, Dale? I am, because I wasn't there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I was hoping Eric Clinton would join us this evening because he knows that story too. Eric had moved to Chatham to take a job as a computer programmer with International Harvester. And so because he had to come to London, you know, often for our executive meetings, we thought it was only fair that once in a while we uh, return the favor and all take the trip down to Chatham and go to him. So this particular uh, event, we were uh, on the train and it was Gerald Skeven and myself and Tom, pretty sure Jill Carroll was along. Diane, my wife, came along on that trip as well. Not sure how many others. But anyway, we all took the train down there. And as you said, Dale, somewhere around Thamesville or something, the train stopped. 
conductor came through and announced that the mechanical problem had, had uh, made us stop and we weren't sure what was wrong and we weren't sure when they were going to, when we were going to be able to get underway again. And the conductor went back out and he had left the door to the uh, train open and the stairs down so he could get out. And I guess he was down underneath there with one of the other technical staff from the, from the engine and they had been poking around and Tom couldn't stand to just sit still for this. So he just, without being invited or asked or anybody stopping him, he just climbed down off the train and got underneath there with the conductor and the other, um, uh, you know, railroad staff person. And he started poking around in the plumbing and the piping and it developed that a brake, uh, some kind of brake fluid pipe had either come loose or had worked its way so that it was leaking somehow or other. And Tom got them all uh, in or organized. They wrapped rags around this pipe. Uh, I'm not sure if they actually fixed it, but Tom had a big smile on his face when he came back into the train. And a few minutes later, the train got moving and we went on our way and had the day as we had planned it. Very good. And so then this brings us up to about 1982. And this was actually a pretty big event in the history of the London RSC, the H.R. Kingston Memorial Lecture, uh, in which we invited astronomer Bart Bach to come up from Arizona and speak about his area of expertise, which was the Milky Way. And Bart Bach had a, a book that went through about five editions, which was the definitive work on the Milky Way at the time. And here uh, you see my cursor. I'm waving back and forth. This is Bart Bach right here, standing beside the president at the time, Robert Cornforth. Uh, the next year, in 1983, Tom became president of the London Center, uh, replacing uh, Bob Cornforth, whose term had ended. So there's Tom right there beside the president of the Sarnia Center, Zdenko Zarak. And if you look at that picture, you can pick out various other RESC members. Uh, but the most important one here is Angie, uh, who would become Tom's wife. Oh, we're back in the early 1980s. And I'll have a few more pictures of the two of them later on as well. Now, Peter wanted to mention something about the uh, May 30th, 1984 annular solar eclipse. So I put this slide up uh, to give you a bit of a background on where the track was. Okay, yeah, thanks, Dale. So you can see the red line across the middle of the map there. And you can see that the red line goes through the southeastern United States and the little uh, star icon right in the middle represents the moment of greatest eclipse. And in planning for all this, of course, this is all, you know, long before the internet and cell phones and whatnot. I remember looking at the map and one of the interstate highways goes from Alabama to uh, Philadelphia, almost exactly along that red line. And I remember making the joke that somewhere back in the 1950s, the person who designed the interstate highway system must have at least known enough about amateur astronomy to know that this was going to be the path of this eclipse in 1984. And he deliberately rode in that interstate highway so that folks could get on the interstate highway and travel to clear skies. And that's, in fact, exactly what happened. Diane and I drove down to uh, New Jersey, where Tom and Angie were living at the time. They had basically just moved there shortly before that and just gotten married. In fact, I think they got married just a, a week or two before the eclipse. I, I'd have to check the, the actual date. But anyway, we met up with them um, and we then we picked, so we drove together in one vehicle a little further on and it was pouring rain and it was cloudy. <clears throat> the prospects for seeing the eclipse didn't look all that good. We stopped overnight somewhere around uh, the south corner of Delaware, where we had originally, where that, where that icon shows the greatest eclipse is, but it was pretty obvious that we weren't going to get to see the eclipse if we stayed there. And so this idea of traveling down this interstate kicked in. I had lots of paper maps with me, and we were watching the TV channels to try and get an update on what way the weather system was moving. And so we did decide that if we left early enough in the morning and drove for four or five hours down that interstate, we would get out from underneath the cloud system, and we had a chance to see the eclipse. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. We, we, we got as far as... Uh, uh, North Carolina, but I'm forgetting the name of the conservation area where, where we pulled over. Our maps hadn't really said exactly where the eclipse path was when we got down as far as North Carolina, and we were a little worried that partial eclipse had already started. We were a little worried we might not be able to figure out 
if we were on the center line in time. An annual eclipse, of course, is not a total solar eclipse. And so it's even more important you got to kind of be in the middle of the path. And so as we're driving along, we um, saw a parking lot full of vans and cars, and we could see telescopes. And we said, okay, well, those folks probably are there for the eclipse. And we drove in and, and, and saw the eclipse just fine. So Tom was part of that, you know, setting it up and making sure that we were on the road in time and everything like that. We, it was a great time for Diane and I and Angie and Tom together. Very good. And here's a shot of Tom Glenos on the left and Jill Carroll on the right back around that period of time. And I don't even know where I took this picture. Okay, so moving right along. Those of you in the club who do astrophotography or are observers probably aren't old enough to remember this is what observational astronomy was like back around 1980, 1985, because the London Center didn't really have a uh, a good dark sky site. We had the Peter Andre complex southwest of London, but it still had bright skies. So if we wanted really dark skies, we had to go somewhere. So we drive out into the middle of nowhere, pull off on the side of the road, set up our telescopes and observe. Back then you didn't have narrow band filters. So astro imagers had to do the same thing. They had to go somewhere dark if they wanted to take pictures. You couldn't image uh, in your backyard. And so here's a few people. I'm not sure I recognize anybody that is my father's 1967 Pontiac on the left, and that looks like George Fenner's Mini right there. So that was astronomy in the London Center back in those days. And that prompted many great searches for a good observing site. And here's a picture of Peter Jedeke and Tom Glenos on the big black police car, which I think was called the Battlestar with a 400 cubic inch engine in it. And I can remember driving around in that with Tom. And here they are pulled off uh, doing <laughs> the London Center site survey, trying to find an observing spot. And we had some temporary observing spots, uh, but we never really came up with a good observing site that could be permanent until Fingal came along. And here's a shot, uh, say a similar era, a lot of the same people, and Tom Glenos on the right-hand side uh, beside David Toth, who I'll come to again later on. And you recognize younger versions of most of the rest of us there. I won't name everybody right now. Uh, but by the early 1990s, Tom's interest in astronomy uh, really came to the fore when he decided to buy, I think it was an OMI mirror. He bought a 20-inch F5 mirror and decided to make a telescope. Uh, he was a pretty handy guy, as we've alluded to. And so you see him in this picture by Peter at his house in Pickering, and you've got the mirror box and the structure for the 20 inch F5. And here's a picture done at Starfest in 1992. Uh, there's Jack Brisbane again, and there's Tom, and there's Angie. And you recognize most of the rest of us, I'm sure. But at that 1992 Starfest, there's, there's, there's Jack again, the guy from Michigan, remember? Here's Tom with the 20 inch F5 set up. And here you have a wooden uh, Dobsonian construction. And that was his sort of initial, uh, I guess, initial mount for the telescope. And uh, here's a few pictures of everybody clustered around. Uh, Jack, Tom, Angie, uh, maybe Diane. And that is Rolf Meyer, the famous Canadian comet hunter. And you know who in the mirror. And there's Tom adjusting the mirror on the telescope. He would, uh, you, you noticed, uh, a rental van there. Well, that's how he would bring this to Starfest originally until he bought a big Dodge Caravan. And this, a few years later, the telescope has changed. Here's a picture I took of him getting the telescope ready at sunset one evening. And now the dog box is gone and there's an aluminum structure. Being a computer guy, what he did is installed encoders on the thing and, and he drove it. So this was actually a clock driven Dobsonian mount back in the uh, mid 1990s. And this was the first telescope I saw Pluto in down at Starfest. Tom and I would uh, always every year we would talk on the phone. He'd call me or I'd talk to him. And it's like, are you going to Starfest this year? And usually we did go to Starfest, but we always had that call to just see if the other guy was going and sort of decide what days it was going to be and how it was all going to play out. Because, of course, there was no Internet back then to do all this planning. 
Stellafane uh, was another big event in 1992 because a lot of Londoners converged on Stellafane. So I want to show you some pictures from that from that trip. Oh, so if you've never if you've never been, here's a nice picture. Um, there's a telescope in the foreground which looks like maybe it's in the telescope competition. And you can see the Porter Turret Telescope here, built in 1930. And you can see the famous pink clubhouse here and uh, telescopes and people milling around. And next slide. Oh, yeah. And a bunch of hosers from Canada showed up. And we've got Dave Toth on the left and John Rosam in the middle, Joe O'Neill to his right, and myself seated at the picnic table. And we had this monumental, I don't know, Joe's here tonight. It was a 12 or 13 hour drive in his van all the way to Stellafane in one go. Uh, and it worked out okay. And uh, Dave Toth was always the larger than life. The Dave passed away quite a while ago now, uh, too young an age. Dave was always a, a larger than life amateur astronomer. And I think he'd be uh, quite appreciative that I'm showing this picture to all of you tonight. And here's Tom at the 1992 Stellafane. Uh, everybody's milling around the swap table or something. Uh, but, um, you know, I should say about Stellafane, we went down there and, you know, there's no facilities to speak of compared to, say, Starfest. I mean, their idea of a shower is a tarp strung between two trees with a cold water hose swung over it. But uh, Tom and Angie uh, were not into cold water hoses, particularly Angie. Uh, strung over tarps in the in the forest. And so Tom was a regular attendee at Stellafane in those days, but they would always stay at Hartness House. And James Hartness was another telescope maker who was affiliated with Russell W. Porter back in the 1920s when this whole thing got going. And so here's a picture of Tom and Angie taken at Hartness House in 1992. And that would be about 10 years after they got married. And then here's a picture 20 years later taken by Peter Jadicki at, uh, it was one of, they have three daughters and it was at one of the, one of the weddings. Uh, so that's kind of nice to have those two pictures. And then at Hartness House, if you go in behind, there's the, there's a, another turret telescope people aren't aware of like, a, and this was based on a 10 inch browser objective. So you could observe and it was cozy warm inside and the whole turret rotated and you could point the telescope at different things. I'll come back to that telescope at the end. And here's just a shot at on Breezy Hill, um, which is where Stellafane is held. And you know, I would encourage anybody who's never been there to go. Um, amateur amateur telescope making started in Vermont in the 1920s, and Russell uh, W. Porter uh, and the gang uh, were responsible for that. So it's sort of today a mecca for amateur astronomy. It attracts amateur astronomers from all across North America. And they're quite well known for their uh, awards for optical excellence and mechanical excellence. And um, one of our members, Walter Campney, has actually recently won several awards there. And I've mentioned him on the forums. So something for you to all consider. And if you go to Stellafane, you never know who you'll run into. Uh, so here we are in 1992 with Peter Jedeke on the right. Some of you will recognize Andreas Gada beside Peter, founder of the North York Astronomical Association. And then guy in the middle, the younger version of David Levy, the Comet Hunter who attends our meetings on Zoom. I think, and Peter might correct me if I'm wrong, that looks like Charles Sinsovsky from Toronto to me, but I'm not sure. And to his left is probably the most famous amateur astronomer you may have never met. That's Walter Scott Houston, who wrote Deep Sky Wonders for Sky and Telescope for decades. Eventually, he died the next year, actually, and uh, Sue French eventually took over and continued Deep Sky Wonders for many years after that. So there you go. The 2023 Stellafane Convention is coming up, and it's always something to consider going to. Uh, Starfest in 19, oh, in 2000 now, a few years later, and you recognize some of these people here. You've got... Um, uh, the whole crew, here's Tom and Angie right here. I'll just point out Mark St. George, another London Center member who was heavily involved in the club in the 90s and the 2000s, but he is no longer with us either. Um, and so the next slide, we go back to Tom in a little bit more detail. And so 
I'll just read this paragraph here. The President Association, this is from an article that uh, Tom and David wrote. The President Association uh, began in June of 2001 when Glinos and the Levies met to discuss using the Jarnak Observatory at Vail, Arizona as the site for a large amateur telescope that Glinos was planning. Over the next two years, we planned and set up an observatory. Our first idea was to house a 20 inch Ritchie Crutchen telescope in a dome, but as the project evolved to a 25 inch RC, it was decided to construct a larger roll off observatory. Now, Tom had been um, fundamental to an outfit in Toronto called UUNet, was, which was providing internet service to the, you know, some of the first internet service to the city of Toronto. And um, they later got bought out by Yahoo or somebody like that. Tom had a little bit of extra money. So that's how this idea of a 20 inch RC came along. Of course, how did it get upgraded to a 25 inch RC? Well, that was interesting. Uh, back then there was a, a fellow a retired airline pilot named Brad who started RC Optical. And that was quite a, quite a business at the time because that was the first company offering RCs to, uh, so to the military, to amateurs, and to the professional community. And he was a really busy guy. And Tom was waiting for this 20 inch. It took quite a while, quite a while to get the 20 inch ready. And just before Tom was supposed to get his 20 inch, um, Brad got a call from the CIA. And the CIA it turned out needed a set of optics for a pop-up reconnaissance mission over, I think it was Pakistan. What they wanted to do is shoot a rocket up, take some pictures of whatever sensitive site in Pakistan they needed images of, and then let the thing burn up in the atmosphere. So Tom's first telescope burned up in the atmosphere. Now, Brad felt kind of bad about that. And so as the next few months went by, uh, Brad offered up his personal 25 inch RC to Tom at a very good price because Tom had been so patient waiting for all this. And so up at the top here, so on April 6, 2004, um, Levy's and the Glinos uh, began a search for asteroids and comets with this 63 and a half centimeter RC and a real state of the art Finger Lake CCD system that Tom had acquired for that telescope. So here's a few pictures of the scope at Jarnak Observatory. So you see the 25 inch RC, uh, you see the roll off building. There's a picture of David standing beside the telescope for scale at the bottom. You notice the things on a paramount. Well, that's interesting. I'm going to come back to that. But uh, the telescope was so big, actually. I mean, Tom had anticipated a 20 inch and had bought, uh, picked up a used Buyer Star Master Series 2. That should ring a bell with most of you. But Tom, once things moved along, uh, realized what he wanted is to have it be a telescope that, could op that he could operate remotely from his basement in Pickering. And so this is where the Paramount came in because it could it could do that. Uh, the problem with the Paramount is the instrument capacity was only about 220 pounds and Tom had about 440 pounds on the mount. But it's a real tribute to the Paramounts that this thing worked for a year or two actually before RC Optical was able to deliver the final mount, which was a big fork mount, which you'll see a little bit later. So about 15 years went by and Tom eventually moved the telescope out to Northeastern Arizona to a town, a near town called Wilcox. And this was a picture he sent me from one of his cameras he had out there. And so you can see looking south, the Orion and Cirrus. Well, when he moved it to Wilcox, I mean, this telescope mount wasn't something you just threw in the back of a panel van and muscled into place by yourself. Uh, so here's the mount being delivered to Wilcox on a big flatbed. And there's the 25 and a half inch RC installed in a roll off building at Wilcox, Arizona. And you can see the welding equipment and on the right, you know, Tom pretty much could do and is, was willing to tackle anything. He was always very confident and very skilled at fixing things and building things. Uh, this was a snapshot he sent me. This must be 2003 because it was the big Mars opposition. And you might look at that picture and say, oh, it's not very good. But actually, if you think about that, that's just a snapshot with that FLIR camera at the probably the prime focus of the 25 and a half inch. And it shows an awful lot of detail. You're looking at the eye of Mars, you're looking at Valles Marineris right there. I mean, there's a lot, but sorry, the eye of Mars, 
And I guess if we get a bit of Valles Mariners down here, but I mean, that's pretty impressive. And at that time, I can distinctly recall a conversation with Tom about this telescope, this whole issue of pretty pictures versus science. I said, are you going to take like pictures of deep sky objects with this? And he was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Everybody's doing that. I want to do science with this telescope. I want to discover things. I mean, so that was the sort of the professional astronomer in him that he, he was really keen to do that. And he went on to do uh, discover quite a few different things. Uh, here's a journal of the AAVSO uh, from 2006. He discovered a new eclipsing binary star in Delphinius. And so that was written up with David and Wendy. And it highlights the discovery of a new eclipsing variable star, uh, which was a product of the Combinant Asteroid Search Program that they initiated. Um, and later on, the telescope was used to discover comet P210E2. Uh, again, the three of them all involved in that. Uh, at about, and you look at that magnitude, 18.7, that was not a bright object. And there's the orbit of the comet right there, just a small orbit, just out almost to Uranus. And of course, Tom had an asteroid named after him, 7124 Glinos. Uh, a main belt asteroid. And that's an interesting one there. You can see the orbit, 7124 Glinos right there because it dips below and above the plane of the solar system. So it's kind of neat. And then Tom visited the Lennon Center in 2012, drove in from Pickering and gave us a talk about how things have been going. So this is at Fanshawe College where we used to meet before we moved to the Cronin. I took this shot of him there. And so he told us the score. So since that telescope had been in operation about seven years, he'd had 656 observing nights, about 190,000 exposures, about 126,000 observations sent to the Minor Planet Center, uh, about 372 object designations, 117 numbered asteroids, 21 named asteroids, and a comet. And so... The good stuff, according to Tom, was Tom was that the comet was a periodic one, 25 years, so it's going to come back uh, frequently. Uh, two near-Earth objects, two Mars-crossing asteroids, and one Jupiter-Trojan asteroid. So pretty productive for an amateur astronomer. And uh, Tom was heavily involved in Unix. He was a computer guy. And uh, he and David named two asteroids after the co-creators of the Unix system. There's and there's Bill Clinton there talking to them about something at the White House. After that meeting, we went to Kelsey's as we always do. And here's a shot of Peter, Tom, and myself at Kelsey's back in 2012 after Tom gave that talk to the London Center. Now, uh, I mentioned that Paramount. Well, or originally, Tom had thought the Byers Star Master Series 2 would do him for the proposed 20 inch RC, but uh, it was not to be. And we are extremely fortunate that he donated that telescope to the London Center, A, because they're rare as hen's teeth, and B, because you can put just about anything on one of these mounts and it will carry it. So that mount doesn't even know there's a C-14 on there. And 27, this brings us up to 2017, another great eclipse. Uh, the total solar, the great American eclipse, a total solar eclipse across the entire United States. And so London Center made a pretty big effort for that one as well. And uh, well, there's a shot of it through my 80 millimeter refractor. And there's a picture of, of us. We'd gone down and staked out a Walmart in a place that looked like it would be clear. The Walmart parking lot had about, I don't know, 2,500 people in it. It filled right up. So you've got, you've got Steve and Asha. There's Tom, Peter, Diane, and Mike Flagel. Now, Tom uh, had a, a philosophy on eclipses, which I will share with you as well. There he is seated in this chair with a small Mac cast. And what he said was he didn't want to take pictures of the eclipse. So what he wanted to do is just look at it. And I think he'd brought in along a point and shoot, snapped a few shots with the point and shoot. But the main thing was just to look at the eclipse, look at all the prominences and just absorb it because you'd get so little time to do this. And with uh, another total eclipse coming up next year, I would suggest you take Tom's advice and probably spend more time looking at it than photographing it. I've seen a couple of total solar eclipses and I am one of those people who spent way too much time photographing it and probably should have spent more time looking at it. So that would be our collective advice to you. And Tom was the one who alerted us to Neowise a couple of years ago. Neowise is a winner was the email I got. He'd been out at 4.15 a.m 
and saw it had a nice bright tail and was easy to see and let us know and we got out there the next the next morning and neil wise put on a spectacular performance these next couple of pictures were taken by peter uh, tom worked at the university of toronto uh, in the computer science department and here's a shot of tom with a whole bunch of servers and then i think it was that same day uh, peter and tom went and saw a baseball game and this was just last summer and really enjoyed themselves and little did we know that we would lose tom the next year so quickly Tom uh, discovered or co-discovered one comet, one variable star, and 168 asteroids. And I'm going to come back to the Hartness House. Uh, now this picture is taken behind the turret telescope, and there's a sundial there. And it says, grow old along with me. The best is yet to be. And I never thought I'd be talking to you about what has happened. I think Tom was extremely productive, but I think it would have been great if he had more time. So thank you very much. <laughs>